G'day and welcome to the Grow Small Business Podcast. I'm your host, Troy Truen. Each week, we speak with an owner who has grown a business with 5 to 30 team members to something bigger. Diving into their numbers and unearthing the pain they've experienced, we explore what they did to overcome each barrier and what they would do differently from day one. Let's get into it. We'll have all the show notes and any resources mentioned in the cast on our website. An ex-television journalist, Renee, fell in love with hot sauces while in Mexico in 2011. Couldn't find anything hot enough back in Australia, so started making her own at home in 2012, age 34. Now sells all around Australia and in America through Amazon, about to start selling chili vodka in Russia. Sales started at $83,000 in the first year, then doubled every year and cracked $1 million in 2019. One FTE to five, they made 35 tons in one week last year through a contract factory, which will double this year. Initially self-funded, started dipping into the mortgage, did a Kickstarter pre-sales crowdfund in 2015 to sell $200,000 of hot sauce and last year took on angel investors who then suggested an equity crowdfund. In mid-2020, raised $2 million from a crowdfund, approached two great mentors, very successful female business owners, felt she'd succeeded when, made a bottle of vodka with shit the bed on it and raised $2 million in a crowdfund. Hardest thing about growing a small business is finding customers when you have no budget, What Renee would tell herself on day one of starting out is, this is going to be huge, but only if you have fun and laugh the whole time and don't take it too seriously. In episode 30, Patrick shares how the distillery was sold four times, grew from four FTE to 23, and won best single malt in the world in 2014, the first distillery outside Scotland, Ireland, or Japan. Welcome everyone. Today I'm interviewing Renee Bunster from Bunster's Hot Sauce, and you're based in Broome, um, beautiful Western Australia. Thanks for your time today, Renee. G'day. Thanks for having me, Troy. <laughs> Let's uh, let the audience how we know each other. So we both know Liam Doyle, who I sit on the advisory board of uh, Old Young's Distillery in the Swan Valley in Western Australia. Um, and he put us in touch, thought you might be um, interested in coming on the show. He's a mover and a shaker, that Liam. <laughs> he is. A lovely bloke too. Yeah, he is. Well, tell our audience a bit about your business, um, what it does and how it makes money. Well, we make money mainly, honestly, the, the lion's share of it is a product called Shit the Bed. It is a hot <laughs> sauce that as soon as people see the, the words on the bottle, they're like, I'm I know what it. that hot sauce, yeah, I, yeah. I know what that's going to do to me. And they just, they want it. They want yeah. to shit the bed. So that's our flagship sauce. And we have a barbecue sauce. It's got no heat in it. Uh, a weaker sauce that's for, for every normal person than shit the bed, then a really hot one. And... We've now got a vodka. We now awesome. have shit the bed vodka as well. <laughs> Great. And how did you start out? Okay. I went on a holiday to Mexico and Central America and I'd never even eaten chili sauce before. Uh, but I just, I got addicted to it. I got addicted to all these beautiful, colourful little bottles and I'd read the Spanish on the back. And so I came back from this holiday back to Perth. This was in 2011, just addicted to hot sauce. I needed to put chili on everything so I bought all the hot sauces and they weren't good enough. So I actually had to get in the kitchen and make my own just, wow. just to be able to have a decent hot sauce. And friends would come over. And I also had uh, a, a really big house and I rented out the rooms to FIFOs. And uh, they were the best housemates ever. They'd just turn up one week a month, give you a handful of money and then take off. And they would walk through and taste it. Say, this is amazing. And so they'd buy lots of bottles of it and take it up onto the mines. Yep. And... Um, and give it to their friends. And then, so they started demanding to buy it and friends started demanding to buy it. And so I just, just would collect this money and just slowly got bigger and bigger and bigger. Great. So 2011 was the year you started. That was the first batch of hot sauce right at the start of 2012. Yep. Mm. Right. And for the audience, FIFO is a fly in, fly out worker, usually two weeks on, two weeks off the mine. So, um, and how old were you in, when you started the business effectively in early 2012? I had just turned 34 in 2012. Yep. Great. And do you have some key numbers you can share to illustrate the growth? Well, uh, like all sort of small hobby businesses, didn't really, didn't really make books for a couple of years because it was just a hobby. It was just yep. sort of money, money comes in, money goes out. Like, oh, I'm not paying tax on this. I, d- I didn't write anything down. But by about 2014, my husband made me start keeping books. And 2014 was the year that we invented Shit the Bed. And so we went from 83 grand and then it's pretty much doubled every year wow. to yep. get us up to uh, doing just over a million dollars in yep. the last year. Great. And yeah, things, things kind of 
you know, retard that growth a bit when we run out of stock and, and run out of money. Uh, but last year, we, we actually know this year it was, we've raised $2 million in equity crowdfunding. So we can juggernaut on. Yeah, even before Liam suggested you come on the cast, I did see a crowdfund raise a few months ago. I was very impressed by how it went. We'll talk about that in a minute, I guess, in funding. But to also help illustrate the growth, uh, maybe talk about the number of full-time equivalents. So it was yourself starting out full-time and what are you up to now? Yeah, that's really interesting. I have to scratch my head to try and remember. Uh, I'd say we'd be at about five full-time equivalents, but there's only about three of us who are officially full-time, which is me, my husband, and uh, a VA who's a jack of all trades. And, uh, and then the rest would be made up by IT people who do a couple of hours a week and yep. another support staff who does about 10 hours a week. And there's a food technologist who does about five or 10 hours a week. So I reckon we're up to about five. Yep. Great. FTEs. Yep. Mm. <laughs> Great. And when was the moment you felt like you'd succeeded? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh, when I uh, made a bottle of vodka. With shit the bed on it. No, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I don't really ever stop and pat myself on the back. I, yeah. I think when I raised $2 million, yeah. when, I, when uh, nearly 2,000 people stood up and said, I will give you money, Renee. Yep. And uh, just because I believe in this company and I want you to keep making products and they just want to see me succeed. It's, yeah. it's, not, um, it's not that they're like, oh, this is going to be a hot investment and I'm going to make $20 billion off of this. It was more that all these people just said, I want to help you to make more amazing products because I love your hot sauce so much that I've really only felt successful in the last few months. Yeah, great. Well done. And what does success look like to you? Oh. Oh. <laughs> Being able to live wherever I want to live yep. and still be able to get my work done like I'm in Broome right now, we, we fled Perth because it was too cold and uh, success to me is being able to flip open the laptop, do a couple of hours of work and shut the laptop and then go and, and Hang out with do the whatever I want. Yep. And that's being a digital nomad, which, is, yep. which, which was what started this whole journey was that we wanted to be digital nomads and we started a, um, a personalised children's book business back in 2011 and... Um, and, you know, like you, you, could, you, could, you could plug in what your kid looked like and what sort of adventures you wanted them to go on. And then the book would get printed out in the UK or Australia and sent to you anywhere in the world. Yep. And it was amazing. It was awesome. Everyone loved it, but we, it just didn't make enough money. If we had more and more books, so it didn't make enough money um, for us to keep living as digital nomads. But that's what supported us while we are in Mexico, while I was eating all these hot sauces where wow. I got the idea for the next business. Yeah, that's great. What a journey to get to where you are now. Yeah. So, and what about manufacturing and logistics, Renee? Who makes the hot sauce and how do you get it in people's kitchens? Yeah. Everybody wants to know this. That's everyone's first question is, do you make it at home yourself? Do you grow the chilies? It's like, (laughs) um, I've got a small backyard. Yeah. Um, I I can't cook that fast. No, we have a factory and it's called contract filling. So you go there or contract manufacturing, or Coman, yep. uh, you go there for about a week, a year, or a week, a couple of times a year, and you just hire the factory, and they just pump out our sauce the whole time. So then we wash our hands at the factory. We don't have to look after that anymore. You know, they take a cut per bottle. That's how it works out. Yep. And then it goes to the 3PL, to another warehouse where they will either send the shipping containers to America or the UK, um, and they do all of, fulfill all the orders or send it to Amazon. Yep. And we have one of those in America as well. Yeah, great. So I, can't, I, I feel like I can't really count those as my staff. No, 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 that's fair enough. And what about, um, so how many weeks a year would you have to be taking over the factory to keep up with demand at the moment? Oh, well, last year it was one week and yep. that was a huge week. We did 35 tonnes. So that sort of lasted us most of this year. But now we're going to have to do two weeks. And then next year we're already, we already have about two weeks booked in. Yep. So it's going up what a fantastic model though you don't have all that infrastructure yourself you can just take over the show one or two three weeks a year whatever you need that's very flexible it's great yeah well everyone says oh what are you what were you raising the money for are you going to build a factory it's like then you're going to have staff you pay rent you know you've got this depreciating asset yep. if you're not running the line 24 7 you're losing money exactly that's right very, the only very... people the, 
The only hot sauces that need a factory are like Tabasco and Sriracha. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, it's very smart, Renee. And out of interest, is it in WA, I assume? It's close. No, it's in Victoria. Okay. Because, and everyone's like, you should make it in Western Australia. What people don't understand is all the food is grown. Yes. Victoria and New South Wales. And so we just sort of truck it a few few hundred metres up the road, process it there, and then the finished sauce goes out. And the majority of people live in the eastern states. So yep. it you makes know, sense. We don't want to truck it all across the Nullarbor, cook it here, and no. then have to truck it all back. Yeah. Uh, for those that don't know Australia that well, the Nullarbor is a <laughs> fucking long and hot, dusty road uh, <laughs> just at the southern part of the mainland. So you don't want to be driving yeah. over it. <clears throat> Imagine Perth. Perth's like LA. And over in Florida is where everybody lives. Yeah. And that, imagine just having to truck everything over to LA and cook it just to truck it back again. That, that's a good way to explain it. Perth is the most remote capital city in the world. Yeah. All right. We'll get back onto the, the track then. Number one thing you'd recommend to marketing a fast growing business. Oh, definitely social media. Uh, mm-hmm. definitely social media and you've got to stay on top of the trends on social media. So you, you, you know, I, I've, I'm like an a, a war veteran. I, I can remember the YouTube adpocalypse 2017 <laughs> where everybody's views got cut in 2017. And so, so that was going well, but then YouTube tanked. So then I had to start focusing on Facebook and Instagram more. Uh, yeah, so the free channels, Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. And I think now it's all about influencers, but it's about genuine influencers. You yeah. know, none of these like... Yeah, you know, we went. Remember, we went through that fake, really yep. fake influencer phrase, and everybody just—I got really turned off by the word influencer. But now, you, you look at your feed and you see people you trust and love, and they go, "Oh man, I love this hot sauce." So yeah, we're, we're finding people like that now. Yeah, I interviewed. Um, so that yeah, I interviewed a Socials. friend of mine. Yeah, great socials. Um, I interviewed a friend of mine, Tim Palmier, on the cast really early on, and he and his wife Beck. Uh, created a company called Flat Tummy Tea in 2013 and then two and a half, three years later, they sold out for $10 million. I did, by the way, <laughs> Renee say to Tim when I met him after sitting on a business panel competition and they came second, I said, Tim, happy to having a beer afterwards. Ha- grab a beer once a month if you want and I've made a shit ton of mistakes in small business. If I can help, if I can help you avoid any of them, that if you're interested, but I will let you know, I don't believe in your business, don't believe in your product, I don't think it's going to work. <laughs> and how wrong was I? <laughs> Did you say that before the flat oh, yeah. tummy tea? Oh, well, yeah. I'm a very direct person. I speak my mind. Um, then no, I didn't want him to, you know, catch up with me and know that I wasn't really <laughs> agreeing with their product and what they were doing or that it was going to work. So, but it worked out well, well and we caught up every month <laughs> just, and they, until they moved to Fremantle actually over your way. They, yes. Yeah. So they, cause they started in Tasmania. I'm all across them. I'm all over it. They started in Tasmania. Then they came to Perth yes. because we managed to pick up someone who worked for them in their oh, boiler room. Right. You know, like the Wolf of Wall Street, Remember yes. Wolf of Wall Street, how they're all just like smile and die. Our bitches yep. always be caught, co- always be closing. Uh, they had a boiler room like that. Yeah. People just finding influencers and yep. there, you know, it was so easy for them because it's a flat tummy tea. It's a detox tip. Yep. Basically gives you diarrhea. Yep. And you lose a bit of weight from what I can gather. Uh, and so they, it was very easy for them to just find all of these Fitspo, you yep. know, hashtag gratitude kind of, it was very easy and they were the first people doing it and they killed it. And so I've actually poached someone yep. who was oh, doing great. that for them. Yeah. She's in Perth. Yeah. So I had, I have a monthly beer meet up here in Hobart. Uh, and last couple of weeks ago, Tim spoke at the last one. Uh, we get someone to speak Ted talk style for 15, 20 minutes. And his topic was influencer marketing. And the big question was, is it still relevant today? Cause he obviously he's got a lot of experience with it early on, but they really got into influence marketing just before it became big. So end of, end of 2013, they got into it. They were working with the Kardashians over the year, you know, a couple of years, et cetera. And his point going back to where we started on this rabbit hole was, <clears throat> His point was, yes, the value of influencer marketing is like quadrupled or grown fivefold since they sold out uh, five years ago. Uh, so it's being used it's, it's, and the returns are even better now. And, but yeah. the, the caveat he said is it, exactly what you just said. It has to be an authentic influencer. They're the ones that are getting the real return. Yeah, there's so many fakes. There's so many fakes. Yes. Yeah. And it's part of, part of the skill and, and this is what the, the chick that he trained has taught us is it's spotting the real ones. It's yes. being able to see through the engagement pods. Yep. Do you know what engagement pods are? No, no. It's a disgusting, murky little world where, say, I'm like a, I don't know, like a mummy blogger. I've got a mummy brand of clothing, you know, for kiddies. 
and I make friends with all these other women who have similar businesses and they, 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 there's some app and they, whenever I post, they all come over and like it and comment and say, Oh, this is amazing. This is so darling. And it's meant to boost up in the algorithm. And Instagram has really cracked down on this sort of thing, but you still see it going on. It's like, hang on a minute. How come the same person comments the same banal bullshit on every single one of your photos? What's yep. going on here? Yep. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you. <laughs> Back to the original question. Social media yeah. is, is so important in marketing. It's something I'm really getting into these days. And I think it's yeah great for a small business to look into. Um, Cause it's <clears> free. <throat> it's absolutely free. Yeah. And so the, the reason, so a lot of our success, the reason why I have a business today is because of free, all the free marketing um, that I, and, and help that I've had from social media. And the way that I got here was because I released this product called shit the bed. It attracted all these people who are immature and love a poo joke to my page. Yeah. And so that told me, that told me what these people want. So I just started posting, you know, poo jokes and dick memes, <laughs> just like immature things. Yep. And they love it. Cause well, I, just, I found a tribe of people. That's great. It also speaks to the power of branding, um, you know, naming your products wisely or, you know, in a smart genius manner like that. Let's talk about funding your business before we get into the, the crowdfunding, which I'm really keen to, to talk a lot about. Um, how did you fund the, the growth of the business up until that crowdfund raise a few months ago? The business was basically funded by itself. Yep. And whatever I could pull out of my pocket up until 2015. And then 2015, we started dipping into our mortgage. So yep. self-funded, self-funded or wages. And just, you know, I wasn't really getting paid. My husband was still working, so he was supporting me. Uh, so, yeah, it was funding itself, dipped into the mortgage. We took on angel investors last year. We got some angel investors, got about 700K. And uh, I'll never forget the meeting where we sat down with them, you know, like the money, the, you know, the, these are from the Perth Angels. They're a bunch of legends. And we showed them all of our debts and things. And it was not pretty. It was like three different credit cards, yep. uh, this much, you know, direct loans from this. It was a bloody mess. And, oh, there was a business loan. Like we basically had as much as we could get. And, uh, and we were just so embarrassed. And they said, we see this all the time. Yes. This is just the reality of a small business. Just, you just get maxed out. Yeah. And we waited till the last possible minute to go to angels and say, yeah. can we have some money? And uh, so we went to angels and then we spent all of that money <laughs> I was like, yeah. because paying, paying off debts, actually they weren't that keen on paying off the debts. No, uh, they wanted us typically to use aren't, the money. Yeah. yeah, no, they wanted us to use the money for growth. So we did. And we, we cooked all this sauce and did all this marketing. And so this year, but we decided we just needed more runway. Yeah. So then we did the equity crowdfunding this year. Yep. Great. Well, just before we get onto that, <clears throat> no other bank finance apart from the mortgage or grants? No, we, we get the export market development grant as right. a sort of a refund every year. Yep. But no, we haven't been given any massive handshakes from the government. Yep. I should probably call them. There's probably like a COVID grant I should get on top of. Yeah, I reckon there would be quite a lot out there at the moment. They're trying to obviously stimulate yeah. the, economy, uh, the, the economy with um, a lot of spending. So I reckon, yeah, have a look. Yeah. Especially so the, R&D. Yes. Oh, definitely R&D. You know about the R&D tax rebate. Yeah. 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 Have you looked at the export finance loan? No. What's that one? I'll send you the link. Um, they'll yeah. loan you money, say, for six months. I'm just putting it on my list here. All right. Well, let's get on to the crowdfunding. Really keen on this. Mm. Uh, we raised 700 grand New Zealand at the end of 2018 for the New Zealand Whiskey Collection um, over there on the Pledge Me platform. You guys use virtual. Very keen to firstly hear what gave you the idea to try to, sorry, to get into the crowdfund. Uh, how much work did you put into it and what was your overall experience? Yeah, um, it was actually the angel investors that we took on last year. As soon as we went to them and we gave them a really good, you know, they got the, sh- the really good share price. They were like, why aren't you crowdfunding? We did a crowdfunding campaign in 2015, just like a regular Kickstarter one, pre-sold product, made 250 grand. Yep. And that was just off the back of the brand and this amazing product. So the angels just kept saying, do an equity crowdfund, do an equity crowdfund and you will solve all of your money issues. And they were absolutely correct. So, yeah, that, that's a good point because in Australia... Uh, you could only do equity crowdfund from 2018. New Zealand, it came in 2014, I think. But before that, in 2018, in Australia, you could do other crowdfund, which is what you just mentioned, pre-sales, which is they don't get any equity, but they pledge to say, I will buy a product when it's ready. 
and you get half a million dollars in orders or quarter of a million dollars in your case. And then when the fund close, closes, you, off you go and make the product and ship it and get that money in. Yeah, that was, so that was that we sort of like baby steps as far as equity as crowdfunding goes, ba- pre-selling product, baby steps. Yep. And it was really nice to do this campaign because it was like, oh, this isn't our first rodeo. It's our second. Yep. Right. Yeah. So the angel said, yep, now try equity crowdfunding. Yep. Yeah, it was so much work, honestly, so much more work than getting angel investors. Angel yes. investors is basically like going to your mum and dad and saying, can I have some money? And they yeah. go, yeah, here you go. You know, they do all the, the DD and... But as you know, that, that there's plenty of other benefits from raising through a crowd. You've got brand ambassadors. Uh, you've also got a, an active sales channel. Um, I went and spoke with the guys at Parrot Dog Brewing in Wellington, New Zealand, before we did our raise. And they got 813 shareholders for their $2 million they raised in 40, 43 hours, I think. That was the new record set at the time. And uh, yeah, and I asked, isn't that a fucking pain in the ass, all those shareholders and the communication? And they said, no, it's not that bad. And we get uh, brand ambassadors around New Zealand talking about our beer, telling us where we're not stocked or it doesn't look good, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And secondly, we've now got a, a new sales channel, our shareholders, and that's doing really well for them. The AGM every year, they, you know, it's a big piss up um, and it's profitable for them. Wow. I would love that's That's one thing I wish I could have some kind of party yeah. with all my shareholders, but they're all over the world. Yeah. Um, we even picked up some in America. Yeah, absolutely. That is the biggest thing there. Brand ambassadors. The best thing about the crowdfunding campaign was the fact that I had 4,000 people who had a, a heap of source and they went and gave it away or told their friends or just said, Hey, look at this because it's, people will always share or talk about something that makes them look funny or cool or interesting and yeah. a bottle of shit the bed makes everyone yep. look amazing. Absolutely. Um, it's got a yeah, bit of virality the, the, about it too. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, like Liam, Liam is, I don't know if this is a, I'm allowed to say this, but it, Liam invested in my yes. company and, mm. uh, and it's, he's introducing, he's talking about it, he's yep. doing it. And so I've got all of these frothing rabid shit yeah. to about 2000 now. Yeah. Great. So 2000, you raised two moons. So the average investment was about a thousand dollars. Oh yeah, it was actually. Yep. Yeah. Great. Mm. Um, anything else on the crowdfunding experience? Oh, okay. So, yeah. So I was going to get to this. It is so much work to run an equity crowdfunding campaign. Yeah. And I've had a few people ask me since, you know, they say, oh, you've raised $2 million. That looks fun and easy. Can <laughs> I do that? And they've, they've gone to Birchall and Birchall has actually like knocked people back. And yeah. said, yeah. no, you're not, you know. You, so even if you can be accepted to do an equity crowdfunding campaign, the offer document, the shares, the, the, oh God, all the paperwork that I didn't touch. But what I concentrated on was the pitch video. Yeah, and how to sell. Yeah. yeah, thank you. How to sell this to people. Yeah. And so this is where all of my background, you know, before I turned 34 and started making hot sauce, I was a television journalist and you yep. know, my job was communication and online yep. communication. So all of that came into play when creating this video to just like break it down and explain it to people without big words and jargon and just yep. say, look, you know, hot sauce comes in, hot sauce goes out, can't make more sauce. Yep. Need, need more money from you if you want more good stuff like hot sauce, <laughs> like vodka. Right. Yep. And, and it's not, not being, you know, rude, but when you're a television journalist, your job is to dumb down the news yep. and make it easily, easily understood by people who are just sitting there at home having a beer. Yep. And so that was what I had to do with the, with the crowdfunding video. Yeah, great. And I did want to ask, yeah, I just, I, I'm really keen to hear how you got two such big hitters, very successful, two business people in Australia, Janine Ellis from Boost Juice and Carolyn... Oh, last name? Chris Cresswell. Carolyn Cresswell from Carmen Carmen Cereals. There we go, Peter. Thank you. Yeah. So how'd that come about? I've been getting mentored by Carolyn since about 2013. I I got up the courage to go and talk to her at this business breakfast where she spoke and I said, Do you mentor people? And she's like, Yep, I do it every morning on my way to work. I was like, oh my God, I can't believe that, how easy that was. And so I've been asked, you know, just having a phone call with her over the years, whenever we get to a critical point in the business. So she's been such an amazing help. Um, and Janine, I, um, I just think Janine's amazing. And so I started, I sent her some hot sauce, just started writing her love letters. And uh, you know what she's like, you can just tell what she's yeah, like. She's, she's just awesome. a really lovely, genuine person. And she yeah. was just incredibly, in, she's incredibly intrigued by me and my business and her son 
loved my hot sauce. So she was like, all right, what does this chick want? And I actually asked her to come on as an angel investor because yep. of, I, I, I would have gone on Shark Tank actually, if the shark, if the show was still on just for the, you know, the media coverage. Yep. Yep. Uh, but I think, I think Shark Tank realized everybody was just going on the show for that. <laughs> and yeah. um, none of the deals, were, none of the deals were going through. That's why the show's not on anymore. Yep. But uh, yeah. So I've met up with Janine for coffee and um, she's actually given me a heap of homework uh, to do and she's not going to speak to me again until I do this homework. Great. She basically is like, she's shark tanking me. Every time I talk to her, she's just like, what about this? What about that? What about that? So <laughs> Jeez, she's that horrible to me. Intense. Yeah. 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 No, she's else? great. So I, I just yeah. asked them. Yeah. Great. That's really good for the audience to hear. Cause I think a lot of people have this misconception that um, I can't get any of that per- business person's time when you don't know you miss hundred percent of the shots Sorry, so you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. If you don't ask, you don't know. And I also like to educate people to say, particularly those that have been in business for a while, they want to give back and often they've got more time anyway. And it's just a coffee or a beer once a month or a lunch. And the advice and the sage words that comes from them can save you a shit ton of mistakes and money and time. Yeah, I actually, yeah, Janine, I just had one coffee with her. And we got so deep in conversation. She almost missed the event that she was, she'd flown <laughs> to Perth to speak at. Yeah, I can see um, that. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, cause she'd just come off Survivor. We just finished watching, watching that season of Survivor. She was on. So I was just like, oh my God, Survivor. I was like, enough about business. Let's talk about Survivor. <laughs> and um, <laughs> she even, she said some things to me in that meeting then that made me go home and say to my husband, right what's going on with this? What's going on with that? And um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, we, we had to, we had to cut a few heads off after, yep. after my first meeting with Janine, cause she's, she, you know, kind of ruthless. You don't get to where you are, where she is no. without being ruthless. So yep. yeah, she's amazing. Yep. And now she's, she's now the new advisor on Celebrity Apprentice Australia with Lorna Jane. So this just got announced. So they're getting Lord Sugar from Alan Sugar from uh, the UK Apprentice and he's amazing. And Janine and Lorna Jane Clarkson are going to be two of the advisors. Awesome. Great. The show. It's going to be so good. Yeah, I'm going to be. I used to watch that and Dragon's Den when I was in, lived in London. I loved <gasps> the shows. Mm. Loved them. Loved them. And how many times did it just descend into sitting around drinking beers going, we should go on Dragon's Den. <laughs> well, and you're like, come up with these <laughs> stupid ideas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, anything else on crowdfunding you want to share with the audience that uh, if anyone's thinking of it, would you, know, would you do it again, I guess, is another question. I probably would. Yeah. I probably would, but I don't think I need to now because I've got all of these investors who uh, we, we can just go to them for money, yep. money now. We don't have to go through. Honestly, it's so much work. It's so much work. Yep. People think that, um, and, and I've seen this over the years, people have shied away from the Kickstarter style of crowdfunding. Which is pre-sales, um, yeah. Yeah, pre-sales um, because they thought that they could just put something up and they'd make heaps of money. Yep. And it failed and it failed and it failed and it failed. And I just don't even know if anyone's doing it anymore. But then when equity crowdfunding came in, you have to do so much work. Pl- mm. Platforms like Virtual and Equitize, uh, they're, they're not going to put your, they're not going to host you if you're not airtight, yep. uh, if yep. you're not a good prospect. Because everybody wants to make their cut, you know, they, yep. they want to make their 6% if they're going to do all this work for you. And they, they did well out of us. Yep. Yeah, they, they generally, so the big ones here in Australia, Equitize, I met, uh, who I met with Chris with a couple of years ago, um, Virtual, I haven't met those guys yet, um, and Pledge Me is another big one. Pledge They've me. moved from New Zealand into Australia. Um, but yeah, six, another between one. six yeah. and eight percent is typically what they'll take. Yeah, there is another one. I can't remember the, of the name yeah. of it. The hidden costs of getting all your legals. You're accounting, your numbers. Yep. You've got to put your numbers out there publicly, obviously. Oh, yeah. Branding, marketing, all. There's another cost there apart from that 6 to 8% of whatever you raise. If you get over your minimum raise, um, you know, the, the platform will take that, but there's those other costs to it. Um, but I, it can look like expensive fundraising, but there's two things I say to that. One is that, um, that new sales channel, the tribe and the brand ambassadors you've got, you're picking up. So you're getting a return on going from that rather than just getting all the money from one investor who's going to buy maybe six bottles of hot sauce a year. And the other thing I would say to that is the valuation typically in crowdfundings are, is a lot higher than what you get with your angels or your traditional investors because typically they're on the, the, the top line multiplier. 
Yeah, yeah, and they're, and they're frothy and it's exciting. And it's the fact that you can invest in a, in a business, a, yep. an early stage business, uh, for, to get in on the ground floor. You know, yep. it's not ASX. Like, I just, I can't, we got so many questions from people just like, this is value too high. Yeah. Well, don't but invest. imagine, don't invest, <laughs> go yeah. away. Yeah. Uh, are you going to pay a, are you going to pay a dividend? No. Do you want the business to fucking grow? <laughs> no, there's no dividends. After we finished, after we finished, you know, it was like we sold 2 million and then they sold another 50 grand over the top. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to sell this many shares. We actually said to all the investors, we wanted people to drop out. We wanted the total to go down yeah. a bit. Um, and we said, look, we're going to extend the cooling off period. <laughs> we're not going to pay dividends. Yep. We just told them all this stuff. Just like, this is shit. It's going to be terrible. <laughs> no one left. And, and, no one left because we engendered more trust in them. Oh, they God, were like, oh, wow, God. I really trust this. No, yeah. they, they did. It, it did drop off and we did get more after the waiting period and some people's money didn't come through. Yep. So I think, I think it went down by about a hundred grand, yep. which is cool. Yeah, great. Um, so, yeah, for, <laughs> for the audience, typically, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, typically crowdfund valuations are done on the multiplier of your sales, not on your profit because often, often they're early growth businesses there's not that much track record behind them or all the profits have been reinvested into yeah. growing the business yeah so if you were to start up today with plenty of funding would you go into your industry this question uh would i go into my industry you know what hot sauce i'd probably do it as a hobby yeah. but i wouldn't expect it to turn into this big thing because i yeah. didn't know this was going to happen yeah. i did not know this was going to happen and what i know now about the food industry is that with food businesses <clears throat> all your money is made on the second sale so everybody buys something once you know in the supermarket think about how many things in the supermarket you bought once you got it home went that's a bit shit i'm never going to buy that again yeah uh the, this business is made off the second sale people going that was amazing i'll buy it again and it is honestly so hard to do that in you know, with a, with a salad dressing yep. or, uh, I don't know, apples, yep. uh, but hot sauce, it's one for, it's addictive. Yes. You really fall in love with it. Um, yeah, gee, that's a really tough question. Mm. I would probably, I probably, if, if we were actually like going to collect all this money together and go, we'd probably be like everyone else and go start a brewery. Yep. <laughs> We'll just end up drunk and rich in a brewery, you know. Well, I sit on a, 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 a craft brewery board and a distillery board, so I'm in a pretty happy place. Yeah, awesome. So, obviously, you sell in Australia. Where else in a, do you sell your sauce? Yeah, we sell our sauce in Australia and America. They're our two biggest markets, and the, then it would be the UK. Yep. We've got a guy over there buying heaps. And we've actually just done a huge order over to Europe. So that's that's going to bump up UK and Europe. We're in Hong Kong. Hong yep. Kong's going really well. Great. And Singapore as well. Awesome. They're the, yeah. they're the ones who are buying like loads of it. But from, from Amazon America, people all over the world can buy it. Yep. They just, they just uh, have to pay a lot of shipping. Yes. And do you use FBA fulfilled by Amazon? Yes, we do. In America or? Both. Yeah, right. they're just yep. quick. They're yep. quick. They're easy to deal with. They get really great shipping rates. Customers love them. Yep. Just We just love it when Amazon takes control of all of that. In the beginning, we wanted to own the customers. So when Amazon does your fulfillment, they steal all the customer details. Um, and we wanted to avoid that for as long as possible. But now we're at the point where we're like, nah, you guys can have them. Yep. It's cool. So for the audience, and correct me if I'm wrong here, Fulfilled by Amazon is their warehousing, a 3PL, third-party third party logistics operations. So they warehouse your source. An order comes in, whether it's on Amazon or from another source. Sorry, that's a really bad choice of words. Um, yeah. if an order, so is it only for Amazon orders they ship? or Just Amazon, yeah. Right. We, still okay. have, we still have our own, um, our own website and our own warehouse for our own orders. So got it. Still, okay, no. Right, we, so, we've got our feet in both yep. ponds at the moment. So maybe cut that last bit there, Peter, because FBA um, fulfilled by Amazon is if you, they can be your three PL, and so they'll ship orders even if they're yeah. not ordered through Amazon. So yeah, but you've chosen. Yeah, no, we yeah we've because we started we started with our yeah. own website and yeah. our own okay. warehouse, but now we're moving towards it. But I think we always will because especially in Australia, we need. When a supermarket says, give us a shit ton of sauce, you know, they, they send it out for us. So we can't get rid of our Australian warehouse, but we have been mooting, just giving it all to Amazon in America. 
Yeah. Um, who do you use for your own 3PL? Uh, I don't think I should say. Okay. That's all right. Yeah, I don't think I should say. <laughs> if you need another one, we've just moved to Wine Depot at the distillery and they're, they're, we're finding they're quite good because we ship into yeah, no. Dan's and into co- direct into Coles, as you'd know. Um, yeah. Wow. So they're good. Wow. I think I, um, when, we, when we finally get this vodka made, I think I'm going to have to give you a call. Yeah, yeah definitely. You and James. Well, take some out, take some out yeah. and see James when you're down in Perth next. He'd love yeah. to, um, and obviously because he knows Liam, he's good mates with Liam as well. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Can you outline the most stressful point in your small business growth journey so our audience can learn from it? All of them. <laughs> All <laughs> of the things. It's the most stressful is where, oh, you know what? Actually, the most stressful thing. The most stressful was when I got a phone call from America and they said, hi, we're the producers of that TV show, Hot Ones, on YouTube. We'd like 10,000 bottles of your sauce in two weeks, please. Thanks. Yeah, no, just do it, okay? Just do it. This is once in a lifetime opportunity. (laughs) Bye. And we, oh, I wish I had one of my bottles, but our bottle is a champagne shape and they wanted us to put it in a 150 ml bottle because they send them all out in subscription boxes and make a killing on that. And uh, so I had two weeks to design the new label, to get the bottles, to get all the ingredients, to get over to Melbourne, to get this cook done. If it was COVID times, like no now, way. it, just, it yeah. wouldn't have happened. Wouldn't have been yeah. able to do it. Um, that was so incredibly stressful. And I couldn't tell anyone about it because they like to keep it all a secret. Uh, but we did it and got all the sauce there. And we had to air freight a heat to them, which was hideously expensive. Yes. Um, but that was the most stressful thing when you get, a, I guess, so to, to, for everyone else, it's when you get a big order, you can't say no to. Yeah. And we yep. didn't have the money as well. We didn't have the money. We had to pull the money out of our ass. I can't remember yep. where it came from. Yeah. Probably a really quick business loan, something. Yeah. Great. And what area in business yep. do you feel you've had to work on the most to add the greatest value? Oh, that's a tough one again. Uh, to add the greatest value for me well, I feel like uh, I do a certain amount of jobs where I add value and my husband does a, there's certain jobs where he adds value. And so his is production and logistics. So he's been adding value through hiring fantastic sourcing people. You know, the, the better the ingredients we get for the lower price yeah. that are Australian, that's, that's where he adds value. Yeah. And bringing down costs on, you know, 20 cents on that postage and packaging there. Adds that's up. how he adds value. Mm. I add value by doing things like this, doing things like this, um, getting media attention, um, getting on TV, um, doing good socials, just using all of these skills, my communication skills, which is is my prior career. That's how I add the most value. Honestly, communication and building trust with customers. Yep. Great. And what have you enjoyed least about managing fast growth? Oh, running out of money, yeah. running out of money, just running out of money. And right now we've got a big pile of money, um, but we ran out of source, you know, so it's just, just running out. Yep. But now we've got money. So now it's like, now we've got to make a lot of source. And now we realize this isn't going to be enough source because sales have gone up so much. So now we're booking in this next cook. It's just that constant hamster wheel. Yep. I'm still yep. on it. Even though there's a big pile of money. <laughs> yeah. So like, oh, I'm going to cook more. Oh, I'm going to cook more. <laughs> And what do you love? What do you love? Running out. Running out. And what do you love most about growing a small business? Touching people's lives. (laughs) (laughs) I, you, this sounds like bullshit, but this, this hot sauce is people are friends with this hot sauce and they get on their social media and they talk to us. And honestly, I've, I've made a hundred thousand friends. Yep. I'm actually friends with my customers. We've started yep. this Facebook group. That's the only thing I look at on Facebook. Now I go in there, I see what people are cooking. We all give each other shit. I think that I've created the most, the thing that I'm proud of the most is creating this community of uh, like-minded, immature, alcoholic, hot sauce loving, uh, <laughs> funny buggers. Yep. And we're all mates and we're all becoming friends. And I, like, I'll become friends with one on Facebook and I'll see that they're friends with all these other people from the group. <laughs> it's, it's, this thing I've created, yeah. it's a little club. That's I love great. that. And what's been the biggest mindset shift for you in your small business growth journey? The, I think the biggest mindset shift for me was when we, 
went to the angel investors for the first time last year and I had to, you know, we had to put it all out there. It's like, yep. what's that, that Renee Zellweger? I'm just a girl standing in front of a boy asking him to love me. It was like that. I had to stand there in front of these people and say, here's what I've got to offer. Do I think you it was Julia me? Roberts so I- in Notting Hill with Hugh Grant. <laughs> Ah, whatever, one of those <laughs> shit films. But they're all good movies, aren't they? They are great, um, yeah. Yeah, it was yeah. Julia Roberts, so really. Um, yeah, being yeah, vulnerable so, and, yeah, with, all, with being, your numbers and your weaknesses and yeah. what, your fuck-ups. Yes, yeah. absolutely going, yeah, look, I know it looks like a bit of a turd, <laughs> but, you know, we're, we're set for big things. And yep. that's even, uh, you know, this equity crowdfund. What, one out of every... Pro- we had we had one person who was like, "This is a fucking turd. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this." Because he he wanted that. You know, he was he came from like a stockbroking mindset, and he yep. just wanted to make a, a ten bagger. You know, twenty yep. bagger. I want to twenty x my money. And it's like, mate, that's not that's not what this investment is about. Maybe in 10, 15 years that will yep. happen, mm. but it's just going to be slow growth, and we just need help and support and everybody yep. to jump on board to get us there. Uh, but yeah, if you're going to look into it, yeah, it looks like a fucking turd on paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But for me, so the mindset, what mindset change for me was, um, no, everybody, I think that everybody wants to be part of this and I'm yeah. going to put myself out there rather than just being me at home in my house with all of my money struggles and my <laughs> supply issues and all the issues just at home. It's, it's putting yourself out there. It's being Julia Roberts and just saying, but just, you know, love me. Yep. Um, is that Good. a mindset shift? Did I? Yes, that is very year? much. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And what's the number one habit you think a small business owner needs to develop and maintain? I've got so many bad habits. <laughs> <laughs> bad habits. Uh, the, uh, the habit. Oh, talk to your customers. Talk mm-hmm. to your customers. Listen to them. If you do face to face selling, listen to what they're saying. Yep. I did face-to-face selling for three years and listened to people say, make one hotter, make one hotter, make one hotter. <laughs> did yeah. I? No. Yeah. I kept making weaker sauces. And then the day that I finally made one hotter, boom, blew up. <laughs> Everybody said, this is perfect. This is because the perfect you, you found, shit the bed. And you, you found your niche. You found the, there's a cohort of people out there that really want that hot sauce, whereas you think yeah. more, there's more people out there that want the milder sauce, but you were better off niching down. Yeah. See, I was making hot sauce for myself and for my girlfriends. Ah, and right. the, the, what I didn't realize was that people who want weaker hot sauces don't get addicted to it and don't spend heaps of money on it. Yep. It's the blokes, you yep. know, with the, with the hotted up utes and the, and the fancy Bundy, the fancy Bundy rum, not yep. the standard Bundy rum. <laughs> they will pay lots more money for their hot sauce yep. and the good stuff. They want the good stuff. Um, so listen to your customers. Don't see them as annoying twerps. Yep. You know, cut out the annoying ones, but listen to the good ones. And also, but also yep. don't let the tail wag, wag the dog too yes, much no. as well. But, and it may, you make a good point there also that you often you are not your customer. We sometimes blind ourselves thinking, well, oh, this is what the market wants. When you haven't actually gone out and tested and validated, yes, this is what the market wants. They want a mild source that gets weaker every year. Yeah. Yeah. And can you? <laughs> <laughs> you are not your customer. That's it. I. That, I've never heard that, and I am absolutely. I am not my customer. My customer is a bloke around the age of thirty. His name's Dave. He's a tradie. He likes going fishing and camping, and he's got a year with a big bull bar. Likes poo joke. <laughs> he does. I'm meeting all my customers up here in Broome. Uh, I'm, I'm getting into the mindset of my yep. customers more and more. Right. But yeah, you are not your customer. So listen to him. Yep. Great. You know, like the bloke, the, the bloke from Skinny Tea, the, yep. the, the guy you know. Plenty, flat, Tim, He's flat tummy skin. tea, yep. Flat tummy tea, how, has he got a flat tummy? Well, he doesn't, but if, if, that's how the business started, Becky. <laughs> there you go. Becky's wife is suffering from it. Yeah, and that's, but yeah, you're right. Yeah. He had to yeah. put himself, obviously, not the mindset of a, because their target, their demographic or the target market was young women with bloating and digestion problems. So, yeah. Yeah. Want to become the best manager you can be? Check out our kick-ass manager course at growasmallbusiness.com. Do the course and add your fellow managers for no extra cost. Join the 30%. 70% of people quit their job because of their manager. Can you talk to how you added people to the team? Some wins, mistakes and advice for those listening? Oh, the first person that I took on was a social media helper. 
basically someone to help me with my socials. And she was in, located in Africa. She's actually a chick from Perth, but she lives in Africa. Uh, so I had, she was in a great time zone. Because my business has always, you know, I've had massive interest from America, there's pretty much a 24-hour clock of where people are online chatting to me. So um, <clears throat> she had the exact same tone and attitude and sense yep. of humour. So she was perfect. We, um, and now we're hiring a lot uh, people from Philippines because they're on the same time zone yep. and have fantastic English. We test their grammar. We put them yep. through grammar tests. Right. We give them um, multiple choice questions about how would you respond to this? And we yep. pick some doozies, real examples right. from our socials page. Um, and, and that's, you know, customer service, everything like that. So grammar test, even Aussies, I would grammar test. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And, and just if multiple choice, it's like quiz, quiz, quiz. There's all this paperwork and only a couple of people. So you might have 50 applicants, but only like 10 make it to this round and then another three to this round. And then there's a clear winner. Yeah. So we just make them do all these tests and if they yeah. want the job, they'll do it. Yeah. Great. What are some things you'd recommend to building a sustainable and kick-ass culture to help with the growth? Yeah. Sustainable and kick-ass culture. Well, what I used to like when I had a job yep. was take us out for drinks. Yeah. Take us out for drinks. Have a Friday night, uh, you know, if you're all in the office, it's Friday afternoon, we buy everyone burritos. Yep. We all go, once a month, we all go and get pissed or we, or there's a carton. We bring in a carton at three o'clock on a Friday. Yep. You know, that's if you live in a dr drinking culture like Australia and London, where I worked for many yep. years, sit down and just break some bread, crack yep. a tinny with your team. That's a good um, advice. Don't put them, don't make them sit through long, boring meetings or yeah. Zoom meetings. Yeah. I, um, I did some volunteering at a radio station in Perth every Wednesday. Meeting time and you could just see everyone go, oh, but I've got work. Oh, fucking yeah. meeting Wednesdays. And, they, and <laughs> meeting. I sat... I sat through one of these meetings and I was like, seriously, this could have been an email. This could have been yep. a three line email. Why did you waste our time? Because it's what we've always done. Yep. Uh, don't, don't be afraid to change things up. Stop wasting your staff's time. Yep. Let them get on with their job and buy them some beers. Yep. Good advice. Mm. Tell our audience how you've handled balance. Oh, balance of what? <laughs> what balance? That's it. I, uh, work, working in the business, before I had kids was great. I could go do yoga when I wanted. I could make the sauce when I wanted. I could do everything. But honestly, I've got, I've got a one-year-old and a five-year-old balance. What's that? They, they came in and ruined everything. I, I'd be doing <laughs> fine if I didn't have kids right now. Yep. Yep. But, uh, it's so different. I see these, you know, these, you know, these people you follow on Instagram who you really look up to and they're like, first thing in the morning I wake up and I drink hot water with lemon and then I write in my gratitude journal for 25 minutes and then I do an hour of yoga and then I do my gym and I just look at these people and I'm like, you don't have kids, do you? You don't have any kids. <laughs> yeah. Fucking hate these people. It all goes so out the wait window. Till you, wait till you have kids. Yeah, exactly. And Especially. I swear that's... Yeah. That's why people who have kids tell you to have kids because they yep. just want to see that smile wiped off your face. <laughs> uh, absolutely. I can, I can relate to that. Both my daughter and I are sick at the moment. So that's just thrown a couple of spanners in our week. Yeah. But balance, honestly, if you don't have kids, oh, mate, just you have a choice to have balance. So yep. just bloody choose it. Pick your yep. time of the day, the thing that you like doing, whether it's your yoga, whether it's having a surf or a walk on the beach or, or your weekly beers with your mates. You have to slot that in and make sure you do it um, and enjoy it because if you're going to have kids, you lose it all. <laughs> and how much professional development did you invest in yourself over the time? Oh, I wish I could do more. I wish I could do more. I, it's now that I realise, oh, this is big hole in my knowledge there yep. that I, I need to go and do. But again, the bloody kids. Uh, but I could. And you know what? We've we've have actually discussed. So I am. Unfortunately, my answer is pretty. It's a blank sheet right yep. now. Uh, but I would definitely. I keep getting asked to do public speaking. Yep. And I think that I should go and do some development yep. in that. That's like top of the list right now. Yep, that's great. The other thing I like to do is most of my professional development is while well, I'm on a bushwalk with my chocolate Labrador, so audio books or podcasts, yeah. Oh, does that count? Yeah, I do that every oh, yeah. day. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I do that. Oh, God, audio books have changed my life. Yeah. Apart from Caroline and Janine, what, what about mentors and coaches? 
don't know if I call them mentors and coaches, but I am um, listening to friends a lot more who in their profession, they're really good at something yep. and I need to know that. So yep. my accountant friends, um, I've even got a, a nutcase friend who's a stockbroker <laughs> who um, has just, just gives advice freely. Yep. Um, so yeah, where I need to learn, I've just been picking the brains of friends who know, oh my God, yep. lawyers, yep. lawyers, They've come in very handy all of a sudden. Yes. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Do you have a board of directors or advisors at the moment? I think it's just me. Yeah, the board of directors is just me and Jamie Davison. Um, and he is one of these accountants. He runs his own accounting firm, Carbon Group. And he's just a bloody legend. God, he, he pays for himself. He just he goes through our books. He's, he froths over it. Like he'll go through our books. <laughs> just go, oh, oh, he found 16 grand the other day yep. from, from some, something. Yes. Uh, yeah. So that's, yeah, that would be my advice. Get a really good director. Yep. On I board totally agree. Add value. Yeah. Yep. All right, Renee, we're on to our final five questions. What do you think is the hardest thing in growing small business? Finding customers. Finding customers when you don't have a budget. Yeah. You've got to work out how to do that. And favourite business book, which has helped you the most? Oh, helped me the most. There hasn't been one book jam-packed full of um, information, but there have been a few over the years, like The Lean Startup and The Purple Cow that sort of offer little bits that, that are really helpful. But I just love Richard Branson's autobiographies. Yeah, they're great. Losing my virginity and then finding my virginity, and just just to, the the amount of shit that man has gone through to get where he is, and yep. but, you know it looks all happy days on the outside, but you know imagine having British Airways coming after you. Yes, and yeah. Coke as well. Coke yep. tried to shut him down, and yep. like just yep. he just tells a lovely story about, and and I so I love to look at him, and he's ended up on a tropical island with his wife that he's been with forever and it's and it, with his two beautiful kids and his grandkids and he's happily ever after. But through the years, yep. just people have come after him viciously, but he made it. And I think yep. that I, I just get the most warm, fuzzy feeling from reading his books. Yeah. yeah. And any great podcasts or online learning tools you use for your own professional development? Um, I love small business Um I love Timbo Reed's uh, podcast. I didn't know about your podcast. I'm going to listen yep. to that. I found a few. So yeah, business podcasts. So and Tim's is uh, small business, big marketing. Have you been, has he yeah. interviewed you yet? Yeah, but oh, a few great. years ago. Yep. Yeah. He should That's probably a, get me back on. It's a great cast. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good one. Um, so yeah, this, but as far as uh, podcasts, just, I'll just pick one here and there that, that has, has people on that I'm interested in yep. listening to. Great. One tool you'd recommend to help grow a small business? I would say one tool to help grow your business, and, and this comes back to the, the thing I said at the start, which is using social media, free social media to market your business, and the best thing you need is a great scheduling tool. Yep. And you can do it through Facebook now, but I just find it a bit clunky. At the moment, I'm using Plan Only because it's, uh, it's cheaper, it's quite cheap, and um, it's fairly good, but it's yep. still not the best. Um, depending on what your budget is and people are always coming up with new scheduling software, but a really good scheduling software so that you can just get all your content in there. You know, you're good to go and you can get on with everything else and know that every day a post is going up and people are commenting and then you can get back to the comments later in the day, but make sure somebody that scheduling software, something's going up every day. I've been doing some work with some other hot source companies or other collaborations with other companies. And I'm like, you're going to put it up at this time. And they're like, Oh, I'll have to remember. I'll have to set an alarm. And I'm like, who doesn't have a fucking scheduling? Yeah. How do you not know how to schedule shit? And what, yeah, scheduling. What, what tool would you, did you use before that? This one? Oh, there's been so many duds. Ho- <laughs> oh, never even used that one. Um, I used ones that actually weren't Instagram legal. Oh God. I can't even remember the names of them. Oh, that's right. I just, there, there've been too many, there've been yep. too many, and I'll start using one, and it'll shit me yeah. to tears, and then I yep. need to move on to the next one. And Plan Ollie hasn't shat me off yet, so I'm using that one. What about Recur Post? Have you used that one? No, what's that one? Um, I'll shoot it through to you. But Peter introduced me to that one, so um, right. I there, should probably yeah. have another look at Hootsuite. Yeah, there's a there's a reason why it's the best. 
It's the biggest, yeah, and they've that, yeah. therefore they got budget to innovate. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Final, my favourite question: What would you tell yourself on day one of starting out? This is going to be huge, but only if you have fun and laugh the whole time and don't take it too seriously. Don't let anyone come in and tell you to take, be serious, don't do this, don't do that, don't listen to them. Just keep cracking jokes and you'll get to, the, you'll, you'll get to this top that you, don't, you can't even imagine yet. Well, it sounds like that's exactly the journey you took, Renee. It uh, sounds like it's been a lot of fun and phenomenal success in the last eight years since you started out in the kitchen at home and uh, great success in your recent crowdfund. But even before that, getting to around a million dollars, over a million dollars in sales, a really a passionate tribe following the business, is that's wonderful success to date and wish you and your husband and the rest of the team all the success into the future. Thank you so much. And thank you for doing this podcast. No it's, worries. It's such a great resource for small businesses. Thank, yeah, thank you. you. I'm really enjoying it and getting a lot out of it. Yeah. Hey, that's a bonus to starting yeah. a podcast is when you actually get something back from it rather than it just like milking all yes. your time. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Awesome. Well, thank you, Renee. And for our audience, we would greatly appreciate a review in iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. More reviews means we bubble up higher in iTunes, etc. So more business owners looking for podcasts to help with their growth will find us. 